Last time we found out that the Eagle, the lunar module of Apollo 11, had successfully landed, albeit not great. Any landing you can walk away from is a good one, but they're not actually going to be walking. This is where things get hairy, where lunar orbit rendezvous is being attempted after a launch from a surface that's never been done before, and making things difficult is that the craft is slightly canted. The reason for this funny looking design is the point we keep hitting, it's all about weight. So they designed the LEM just for landing on the moon and coming back up again. Yeah, well, half of it anyway. The bottom part of the LEM is now sort of a launch platform, launching the upper part of it into the air. After all, they don't need all the stuff for landing anymore, they've landed. Matter of fact, they don't even need the rest of the LEM either, it's not coming back to Earth. All they need to do is bring the astronauts and any equipment and moon rocks up into orbit, dock with Columbia, haul everything over, and then they can dump that piece too. All about weight. Don't bring anything you don't need, including the very craft that helped you make history. I mean, I'm sure the Smithsonian would like it, but Neil and Buzz's families would probably prefer getting them back more. Now that angle is going to be a problem. It's supposed to launch straight up, and it won't. Instead, it flails away, flopping about up there like it's become Abbott and Costello go to the moon or something. But this isn't the Olympics. Style points don't matter. So after getting it straightened out, the Eagle is on course for its rendezvous with Columbia. And after the titles, it's two months later, and Ed is still in the doghouse as far as Werner von Braun goes. NASA has got that same kind of relationship with the White House right now. When national intelligence brings in blueprints for a Soviet military base on the moon, there's a hard-on to beat them to the punch. We may have lost the moon, but we can, we can still win the race for the base. Race for the base? Catchy, right? God, the space program is in the hands of Dr. Seuss. The platoon on the moon was working quite hard, but the Russians were keeping them all on their guard. They're building a base, yes, you wait and see. They're going to steal all of our helium-3. Von Braun won't go along with it. He remembers when the Wehrmacht saw how his rocket could be turned into the V-2, and he doesn't want to have NASA head in the same direction. Nixon's peeved and tells Kissinger that he wants Von Braun out of there, but that's not easy. Yes, he could just have the guy fired, but he's a national hero right now. And firing a national hero for standing on their principles, that doesn't go down very well. So Nixon, and I know you won't find this easy to believe, thinks that they might have to play dirty. Meanwhile, Ed has had it up to here with piloting a desk and talks about going back to the Navy. With his reputation as an astronaut, he'd likely be put in command of an entire air wing, flying sorties over Vietnam. His wife is not too thrilled about that idea, but distracting is word about the hearings regarding NASA's failure to reach the moon first. Prominent in this is Senator Ted Kennedy. Now, in the real world, just before the Apollo 11 landing, he had this little driving incident at Chappaquiddick, which resulted in a young woman's death, and that torpedoed his chance for the 1972 presidential race. And it cast such a shadow over him that he made only one attempt at the presidency, against Jimmy Carter during his re-election bid, and flopped. However, the show established last time that Kennedy canceled his trip after the Russian moon landing to get to the bottom of this thing, which makes sense as losing the trip to the moon could be pinned on Nixon and help Kennedy challenge the sitting president for the Oval Office. Hence why he's involved in these hearings, and why Nixon needs to demonstrate his commitment to space. In politics like in marriage, you need to demonstrate resolve after you've screwed up. Hey, you tell Danny that I said, um... Um. Like Gordo here, whose wife just heard one of the Cape Cookies having a blast off. Cape Cookie is the term for the women who are at Cape Kennedy who sleep with the astronauts, even though they're not supposed to, on the grounds that they're supposed to be an avatar for all that's great about America, and that really shouldn't include cheating on your wife. Someone trying for a better launch than a toilet is Margot, who wants a job down in Mission Control. The actual Mission Control, not in the backup area. It goes well enough, all things considered, but it's time that we join the janitor, the unsung hero of NASA. Actually, this guy and his daughter, Alita, 
spent the last episode crossing the border from Mexico, and we saw that Alita is clearly inspired by space, and apparently also by burning things. So, you know, that's a thing. Speaking of destruction, Gordo's wife is tossing all his shit out on the lawn, as well she should. It's bad enough that he's cheating on her. It's worse that he's compounding it by being so brazen about it. I mean, yeah, morally they are the equivalent. It's just, it's just a question of respect. If, you, if you're not even willing to be careful about it, that says, I don't give a shit whether or not you know. Cheating on your spouse and making it clear to them that you are is the equivalent of accidentally saying the N-word in Walmart and when everyone turns and stares at you, just replying, Yeah, I said it. Anyway, Tracy talks to Karen about the situation, and the point is made that divorcing an astronaut is not something that can be done quietly. The man came within eight miles of the surface of the moon. That's as close as you can get without walking on it. At this point, only four men have actually performed a moonwalk. It would be five if you count Michael Jackson. Meanwhile, Margot has gotten some good news. She's passed and is going to mission control. And aside of a little harmless hazing, it's off to a good start. But Gordo's is off to a bad one. He buzzes the house on his jet when he should be showing up with flowers. Like all the flowers. Being delivered by Elvis. Even then, it'd be a tough crowd. Actually, she's gracious enough to let things slide, although he is likely getting spit and boogers in every meal he eats for the rest of his life. The Baldwins decide to have a large cookout, and Ed takes the opportunity to talk things over with Neil Armstrong, first American on the moon, to talk about the landing. After they share that feeling of being at the controls, we cut to Ed's office, where one of the congressmen involved is thrilled to meet the guy who got so damn close to the moon. Matter of fact, he and the head of NASA think Ed was telling it like it is when he said he should have said, fuck it, hold my beer and let's see if I can land this thing. They want him to come to the hearings and say that Von Braun cost them the moon with his touchy-feely, let's not needlessly risk lives for political gains crap. The president's real keen on this, Ed. Hmm. And he remembers his friends. Both of them. Ed and Karen discuss the pros and cons of throwing Von Braun under the bus, and faster than you can say, doodly, 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 as in front of Congress, talking about Apollos 10 and 11. While he agrees that Von Braun made the call for Apollo 10 to be a trial run, he was the one in position to actually land it if he so chose. Ed even considered it briefly, figuring Gene Kranz would back him if he landed on the moon. But he didn't. As the commander, he acted responsibly and followed the mission, rather than acting like the cowboy test pilot he was channeling during that drunken ramble. Well, Gordo's not happy when he learns that Ed thought about landing, because if he'd said something, Gordo would have said, hell yes. The thing about Gordo's position to understand is that the two guys on the lem are a team, yes. The thing is, though, that team is not like Han Solo and Chewbacca. It's more like Captain America and Bucky. And I don't mean the new Bucky, I mean OG Bucky. For the moon landing, Neil Armstrong was the commander and Buzz Aldrin was the lunar module pilot. Guess what Buzz's job was? If you guessed it was to pilot the lunar module, no, but thanks for playing. Not to say his role was nothing, but just understand. Michael Collins was the more senior astronaut. He was trusted with operating the CSM single-handedly. Buzz was there to assist Neil. The point is, Gordo expecting that capsule to suddenly turn into a forum to discuss Ed's decision is presumptive given his role there is to be sidekick, especially when it's Gordo who, as Ed puts it, shows up to the sim stinking of alcohol and pussy. This stuff, incidentally, is why Ed and Gordo need to be made up characters, if you're wondering, as Stafford, Ed's real-life counterpart, is very much alive. It's one thing if you want to show him with a reenactment of historical events, even if dramatized. But once you are inventing their lives, then suddenly you've got to start worrying about being sued. And yes, the guy Gordo plays is dead, but suggesting the 11th man to walk on the moon showed up to work liquored up after cheating on his wife might just piss his relatives off. During this, Von Braun is giving his testimony where he talks about his even more powerful rocket for the next stage and how the race will continue long past the moon. 
and that a lunar military base is simply a distraction from where we should be going from here. Von Braun is doing well. So Congressman Salmon decides to bring Godwin into it by mentioning, um, weren't you actually a Nazi? And in fact, he pulls out a photo which has both Von Braun and Hitler in it, in the same picture. Yeah, that's, that's not good for anybody's image. By the time he brings out the pictures of the dead from the concentration camp that built the V2, even Ed probably wants to pop it and go, uh, forget everything I said, it's all this guy's fault. They even include the Tom Lehrer song Werner von Braun in the show as a reminder of the fact that during the war he was on the Zig Heil side. Well, this has had quite an impact on Margot's relationship with von Braun. He defends himself saying that if he'd tried to stop it, he'd probably be dead and that the fact that he's here and not in Russia was because he wanted the U.S. to have his work, not the Ruskies. But the fact that all those people died and he did nothing is all that matters to Margot. <laughs> Women. Can't let go of a little genocide. Meanwhile, in a latest subplot... Aleda? Aleda! One of the things you forget as a grown-up is that kids understand what is right and what is wrong, but usually that gets overruled, and not by malice, by curiosity. They're still trying to assimilate the world into their minds, and that drive is great at telling common sense to piss off. So when she tells her father, I want to be inside the fire, even she doesn't know what it means. He takes her to see one of the rockets at NASA to be inspired, and Maybe save on making fires until she has an engineering degree. Well, it's time to head back to the moon with Apollo 12. Things are moving forward. Incidentally, if you have Max, formerly HBO Max, I can't recommend enough Tom Hanks miniseries from the Earth to the Moon. It is a great series, and I always remember a line that Alan Bean, the lunar module pilot on Apollo 12, said about their flight. history's ultimate anticlimax. We had made history, now let's do some science since we're up here anyway. Well, not the case here. Now the purpose of Apollo 12 is to look for ideal sites for our new lunar military base. Man, that sounds like it should come with a quest marker and a button tap minigame. Deke swings by Ed's place and gives him a little gift, the plaque that had been going on the eagle, the famous one where the title comes in. We came in peace for all mankind. Now we're going to build a military base on it. Fuck peace. We tried coming in peace and that didn't work out. Now we're coming to start some shit. Deke has decided with Von Braun gone and Ed showing the guts to own that he was mistaken rather than lie and say he never said it. He's going to get to go back up to the moon on Apollo 15. But no time to celebrate. The Soviets have again made history. They've just put the first woman on the moon. Oh, what will that mean for NASA? Well, let's take a look at episode three. <laughs> 